I'm Mark Matsumoto and welcome to my Tokyo kitchen. Today I'm going to show you how to make Japanese potato croquettes or koroke as we call them here in Japan. So stick around. Croquettes were introduced to Japan in the 1870s as the country was opening up to the west. But because dairy wasn't widely available at the time, the traditional bechamel filling was replaced with a combination of mashed potatoes and meat. This recipe from 1888 was one of the first written records of koroke I could find, and it's made with mashed potatoes, onions, and a mixture of minced meats. These days, koroke is one of the most popular yoshoku foods, and they can be found almost anywhere. For my version, I make a flavorful mixture of browned onions and hand minced pork in a concentrated gravy that I work into the potatoes. This creates a decadently rich filling that's bursting with flavor, but the crispy panko shell holds it together just long enough for it to hit your mouth. That's where it explodes into a contrast of crispy and creamy textures and a balance of savory and sweet taste that'll tickle your umami taste buds. Looks good, right? Let's have a look at our ingredients. For the filling, I'm using 500 grams of starchy potatoes like russet or Yukon gold, 320 grams of pork shoulder with plenty of marbling, one tablespoon of oyster sauce, one tablespoon of vegetable oil, and one small onion. To season this, I've got a quarter cup of chicken stock, one tablespoon of potato starch, a quarter teaspoon of salt, a quarter teaspoon of freshly ground white pepper, and some nutmeg. To bread the koroke, I'm using a quarter cup of flour, one large egg, and a bag of panko or Japanese breadcrumbs. The koroke is going to be seasoned enough to serve on its own, but it's even better with some chuno sauce, okonomiyaki sauce, or Worcestershire sauce. It's also traditionally served with a bed of shredded cabbage, along with something to add a pop of color like these tomatoes. The first thing you want to do is wash and scrub the potatoes with your hands. We're going to boil these with the skin on to keep them from getting waterlogged, so you want to be gentle to ensure you don't scrape the skin off. By the way, these may look like russet potatoes, but they're a Japanese variety called May Queen, which are much smaller, so be sure to use the weight measure and not the number of potatoes. Once the potatoes are nice and clean, add them to a pot, and cover them with at least an inch of water. Now I'm going to cover this with a lid and turn the stove on to high heat and bring this to a boil. Once it's at a rolling boil, remove the lid and turn down the heat to maintain a simmer. By cooking the potatoes whole, the skin prevents the water from soaking into the potato, which is going to make our filling easier to handle and it's also going to give our koroke a rich, creamy texture. Okay, these have been cooking for about 35 minutes, so I'm going to check them with a skewer. And yup, these are done. Let's get these out of the pot and into a bowl to cool enough to handle. Next, I'm going to peel and mince our onion. I always start by cutting a few slits horizontally into both sides of the onion. Then I'm going to cut vertical slits from the top almost all the way to the root end. Now I can turn the onion 90 degrees and mince it up. You can always get the last little bit by laying it down and slicing in one direction and turning it 90 degrees and chopping in the other direction. For the pork shoulder, I'm going to slice it up into 8 inch thick slices. This has been sitting out for a while, which is why it's so soft, but ideally you want to use it straight out of the fridge or even partially frozen so it's nice and firm. Then I'm going to cut the slices into thin strips like this. As you can see, this pork shoulder has a ton of marbling, which is important because this is going to render out as we cook it and infuse our potatoes with flavor and richness. Finally, I'm going to turn the strips of pork 90 degrees and mince it up. You can also use ground pork if you're feeling lazy, but hand mincing makes a big difference in the texture of the koroke, so I recommend taking the time to do this. 
Now I'm gonna get this into a bowl and pour in the oyster sauce. Then I'm gonna mix it with my hand to evenly distribute it and season the pork. For the gravy, I'm gonna add the potato starch, salt, and white pepper to a bowl, and then I'm gonna use a microplane to grate in about an eighth teaspoon of nutmeg. Both white pepper and nutmeg are spices that lose their flavor rapidly once they're ground, so I highly recommend grinding both of these fresh. Then I'm gonna add the chicken stock and stir it in until the salt is dissolved and the starch is evenly distributed. Okay, the potatoes have cooled enough to handle, so I'm gonna use a ricer to mash them. This is the best way to get smooth mashed potatoes, and it has the added benefit of peeling them for you. If you don't have one, you can peel the potatoes by hand, and then you can use a fork or a regular potato masher to mash them up. Okay, let's cover this and set it aside. To make the filling, I'm gonna add the oil to a large pan over medium heat, and then I'm gonna add the minced onions. Saute these until they're translucent and just starting to brown around the edges. The ingredients for koroke are super basic and the Maillard browning on the onions and meat is where this dish gets a lot of its flavor. So take your time here. The onions will continue to brown once we add the meat. So once they're looking like this, add the minced pork and saute it until it's cooked through and a good amount of the fat is rendered out. This will take another four to five minutes. Now I'm gonna give the gravy mixture a stir to redistribute the starch and pour it in. Then we wanna mix everything together until we have a thick paste coating the meat. For the final step, I'm gonna add the mashed potato, and fold this together with the meat mixture until it's integrated and uniform in color. The mixture is gonna be really stiff, but it should hold together and not be crumbly. Okay, this smells insanely delicious and you're gonna be tempted to eat it straight out of the pan, but we're not done yet, so get this into a tray to cool and spread it into a thin, even layer. Then I'm gonna spread a sheet of parchment paper on top and press it down to keep the potatoes from drying out and we're gonna let this cool to room temperature. Once it's cooled off, you wanna cover it and refrigerate it overnight to allow the flavors to mingle. Through the magic of YouTube, it's now the next day, so let's see how this looks. By the way, if you don't have time to wait, even a few hours is better than none. That's looking nice and firm, so let's use a pastry knife to portion this into 12 blocks. This isn't necessary, but it makes it easier to get your koroke to be about the same size. Now I'm going to scoop out a block of filling and use my hands to press and shape it into a thick patty. Koroke can be a variety of shapes, but I don't recommend making them thicker than an inch or so or they're not going to heat through properly. Also, you want to be careful not to have any cracks in the surface or pockets of air in the patty, or the koroke is going to explode when you fry it. Tossing between your hands like this is a good way to get rid of any pockets of air. By the way, you may notice that these will soften as they heat up in your hands, so you want to work fairly quickly so they don't get too soft to handle. Now we want to dust these with an even coating of flour. Just place a patty in a bowl of flour and roll it around to coat it. Then you want to pat off any excess flour on the surface like this. The flour is going to work with the egg in the next step to create an edible glue to bind the breadcrumbs onto the surface of our koroke, so make sure you don't miss any spots. Once they're all dusted with flour, prepare a tray filled with panko and then break an egg into a bowl. Then we're going to use chopsticks or a whisk to beat the egg until it's uniform in color. Now we can dip our potato patties into the egg and gently flip it a few times to coat every surface. And then you can drop it onto the bed of panko. Use your other hand to scoop some panko on top of the koroke 
and then I'm gonna gently press the breadcrumbs into the coating. You can also squeeze from all around the patty like this to retain the shape while getting the panko to stick. By the way, it's really important that you use one hand for the egg and the other for the panko. Otherwise, you're gonna end up breading your fingers instead of the patties. Okay, last one. And it looks like I used a bit too much panko, but it's better to have too much than not enough, so I'm gonna put the leftovers into a zipper bag and freeze it. It won't be good for breading anything, but it's perfect for using in hamburg steak or meatballs, and it'll keep for months in the freezer until you need it. Okay, let's add about 2 inches of vegetable oil into a pot with high sides. And then I'm gonna preheat this to 320 degrees Fahrenheit or 160 Celsius. The last thing we need to prep is a cooling rack lined with a few sheets of paper towels to drain our korokke. Before we fry these up, I want to take a moment to thank all of you for supporting my work here. Whether you've signed up for my secret stash of recipes, or you're just watching my videos through to the end. There are lots of ways to help me out, so hit the link in the description down below to see what you can do. Okay, our oil is up to temperature, so I'm gonna gently lower the koroke into the oil. By the way, I'm doing this with my hand because it's how I always do it, but if you don't have a lot of experience frying, you should probably use tongs so you don't burn yourself. Now we just need to let these fry for about 6 minutes or until they're golden brown and crisp on both sides. Be sure to flip them over every few minutes so they brown evenly. Okay, these are looking perfect so let's get them out of the pot and onto our paper towel lined rack to drain. Make sure you clean the oil with a mesh skimmer between batches so you don't end up with burnt panko on the outside of your next batch. To plate the koroke, I'm gonna put down a few shiso leaves, and then I'm gonna make a nice bed of shredded cabbage in the back of the plate like this. Let's add a few tomatoes off to one side for a pop of color, and then I'm gonna add the koroke, resting them up against the bed of cabbage like this. Okay, our plate of Japanese potato korokke are ready to eat, so let's sauce them up. I'm using okonomiyaki sauce today, but chuno, tonkatsu, or Worcestershire sauce all work well for these. Let's have a look inside one of these. Wow, look at that! <laughs> it looks so crispy, listen to that. Mmm, hot. It's just potato and some pork, but words can't describe how delicious this is. I mean, honestly, this is ridiculous. It's got so much flavor. You've got those caramelized onions in there that give it that kind of French onion soup taste and a little bit of sweetness. You've got loads of umami from the onions, pork, and oyster sauce. And you've got that ultra crisp crust on the outside. Mmm. With that sweet and savory sauce, <laughs> it's really good. And because you had that potato starch in there to thicken up those juices, it was super easy to handle and it's given it this nice rich texture. Oh, I'm gonna eat all of these. You know, these were a little bit of work to make, but if you split it between two days, it's not too bad. And it's definitely worth it. Well, I'm gonna go fry up the rest of these for dinner, but check out this playlist for more Japanese home cooking classics. And I'll catch you in the next one. <laughs>